Authority ranking relationships constitute an important category of human relationships, according to relational models theory. Relationship regulation theory is the normative extension of that theory to moral psychology. It suggests that the motives, emotions, reasons, the norms, the principles we use in thinking about what to do and what kind of people to be are shaped and really depend on the character and the model we use in our human relationships. So it matters whether we're in a communal sharing relationship, an authority ranking relationship, an equality matching relationship, or a market pricing relationship. We're going to have different motives, different reasons, different intentions, different emotions, different principles that govern us. We're going to claim different rights, different responsibilities, all depending on the nature of the relationship involved. Well, today I want to focus on authority ranking relationships. That's why I'm wearing a tie, authority ranking. That's a symbol of authority in our society. And in general, people in a higher position in a hierarchy tend to have symbols that they use to signal their higher status. In fact, the status you have in a hierarchy forms an important part of your identity. It not only determines your role, your rights, your responsibilities, your privileges within that hierarchy, but often, if it's a hierarchy that matters to you at any rate, it becomes important to your conception of who you are. People will identify themselves. And in fact, for many years after they leave a position, will still be called president, senator, dean, and so on. And so these things matter to people in a way that's more fundamental than simply the rights and responsibilities they have within a given organization. Now, in thinking about authority ranking relationships, we need to think carefully about positions, because if X is superior to Y in the hierarchy, for example, then the privileges, rights, and responsibilities of X are going to be quite different from the rights, responsibilities, and privileges of Y. The norms governing X are going to be different from the norms governing Y. And so position is crucial for understanding norms. When we think about communal sharing relationships or equality matching relationships or market pricing relationships, there's a kind of symmetry involved. It doesn't matter which side of the relationship you're on. There isn't really a side. There is to some degree in market pricing relationships. There is a kind of buyer-seller divide. But in authority ranking relationships, the kind of divide between superior and subordinate is really crucial. It determines everything, really, about the nature of that relationship. And so, in thinking about authority ranking relationships, we really need to focus on two questions. What are the privileges, rights, and responsibilities of superiors? And what are the privileges, rights, and responsibilities of their subordinates? What norms govern superiors? What norms govern subordinates? Let's begin, then, by thinking about someone who is in the higher position in an authority ranking relationship. What exactly does that mean? Well, for one thing, it means that person is typically entitled to greater rewards, greater benefits. And so that person is going to have more things, better things. They're going to get them sooner. The office that the president has will be typically larger and more impressive than the office of the vice president. And that will be more impressive than the office of some middle manager. And so there is that kind of relationship within a university. The president is going to have a higher salary and a larger office than vice presidents, than the provost, than various deans, than chairs, than ordinary professors, than graduate students, and so on. There's a kind of pecking order, if you will, all the way down, and it's reflected in privileges, in salaries, in size of offices, in various other benefits that people have attached to the positions they hold. Of course, going along with that, there is also an increase in responsibility. Now, the responsibility does grant power. Often, the person in the superior position has control over what the person who is their subordinate does, at least to some degree. They may delegate responsibilities, and there may be some things that they don't control. But overall, they exercise a significant control over the decision-making of their subordinates and of the material conditions of their subordinates. They can determine salary levels, for example. They assign offices. They assign duties. They can group people in various project groups according to their decision, not the decisions of those who are actually going to be doing the work. 
So there's considerable power attached to the person on the top. But there are significant responsibilities. The person in the higher position has the responsibility of nurturing, protecting, caring for, training the person in the lower position. And so there is a significant responsibility. Think about the hierarchy within a family, for example. The parent is to protect, care for, nurture the child. The child is to obey the parent. The parent gets to make a lot of decisions for the child. The child doesn't necessarily get to choose what to have for dinner, doesn't get to choose whether or not to go to school, and so on. The parent makes crucial decisions for the child. A person in a higher position gets to assign duties to the person below. So it's not just that there are greater goods attached to higher positions, that there is an increase in power and an increase in responsibility. But there is also the power to determine the responsibilities of subordinates. The responsibility of the subordinate, like the goods attached to the position the subordinate holds, their salary, for example, their office, and so on, depend on the decisions of the person at a higher level. And so, to some extent, there is an independence to the person at the top. Plato considered the question of why a good person would actually want to lead, why they would want to be in a position of power. And the answer is they fear the control of people who are worse than they are. Well, that's not the only reason people seek power and seek higher position. I think there is something deep in us that makes us seek that kind of advancement to have the higher position in a hierarchy. But in addition to that, what Plato is identifying is a serious concern. You have the independence at the top to set your own agenda. You don't have that power, that independence lower down. And so that dependence of people lower in the hierarchy on people above them, not only in terms of what goods they get and having to follow the orders of those above them, but also in just having their own duties, their own responsibilities determined by someone else, that can be a serious disadvantage. So people higher in a hierarchy have access to more information, have access to more goods. They can control what information their subordinates get, what goods their subordinates get. They can assign them duties and responsibilities. All of those are significant advantages to being in a higher position in the hierarchy. The duties of those higher in the hierarchy are also typically more rewarding, more interesting, less onerous than those lower. They are also generally less dangerous. And so all of those are additional advantages to having a higher position. People at a high position in the hierarchy often are not only leaders, but to some extent provide the glue for the group. They ex exercise what Max Weber called charismatic authority. Partly, the group hangs together because they're all followers of that leader. That can happen in a cult in an extreme form, but it can also happen in benign forms in lots of organizations, where a significant charismatic leader brings followers along willingly, saying, yes, I want to follow you, I want to be directed by you. So the leader is capable of directing the activities of subordinates, but often the subordinates find that really useful. Not only do they want to follow those directions, they may find it attractive to have somebody else make crucial decisions for them. There are advantages to not being in a position of authority. For 10 years, I was chair of the philosophy department at the University of Texas at Austin. There were many advantages to being in that position, but there are also many advantages to not being in that position. And now that I'm not in it any longer, I'm well aware of the advantages of not having those responsibilities, not having those headaches, allowing someone else to make certain crucial decisions, and leaving it in their capable hands rather than having the responsibility of doing it myself. So there are real burdens to having a higher position in the hierarchy. It's not all gravy. It's not all good. What are the norms that govern people who are in lower positions in the hierarchy? Well, they have to accept direction on the part of those above them. They have an obligation to obey the people above them, at least unless there is some very serious moral constraint that prevents them from doing so. They have a responsibility to serve that person and to subjugate their own interests to the interests of the person above them. So they want to make the boss look good, and they have a responsibility of making the boss look good. 
They, in general, have a responsibility not only to do what the boss tells them to do, but also to serve the needs of the group. And so, to some extent, the person who enters into employment in this way, and is in a lower position of a hierarchy, agrees to subjugate their own self-interest to the self-interest of the group, at least in certain respects. A person lower in the hierarchy often views following that leader as an important part of their identity. They may well think of themselves as followers of that particular person. We think of that most obviously when we think about religions or we think about political movements, but it can happen within a company. You can be somebody who's part of that person's division or that person's group, and there can be a strong sense of identity tied to that particular leader. Now, this kind of charismatic leadership can be dangerous because an organization can come to depend on it, and when that leader is no longer there, the organization can find that the glue that held it together falls apart. That's happened in many religious organizations, where a charismatic pastor, for example, attracts a significant congregation. But then when that person retires or leaves, the entire church falls apart. People were there to follow that particular person, rather than to follow Jesus Christ, or to follow the Buddha, or to follow whoever that religious organization was dedicated to in the larger sense. And the same thing can happen within a company. If somebody is strongly attracted to the leadership of Lee Iacocca, to take an example from my own younger days, or Steve Jobs, or Mark Zuckerberg, or any particular person, if that person leaves, if that person retires, if that person dies, all of a sudden the identity of the company itself can become an issue because it's no longer clear who has the responsibility of setting the direction or whether the follower is any longer committed to subjugating their own self-interest to the self-interest of the next leader. Authority ranking relationships are pretty fundamental to human nature. We find them in the family, where parents are above children. There is a kind of structure built into our thinking. Every human society has, at least in some respects, authority ranking relationships. And everybody finds it attractive in some ways to have somebody to boss around, in certain respects anyway, but also to have someone else make crucial decisions and direct them. So we are, if you will, natural followers and natural leaders in various respects in our lives. That doesn't necessarily mean we're good ones, however, and like any other relationship model, this has many good features. It can also have some problematic features. The good features are that we do have that need to follow. I can't really be responsible for making decisions in every aspect of my life. And so it's good to have people making certain decisions for me. I want to be able to follow. And indeed, I'm not so charismatic. I feel fully independent and capable of running my own life and setting my own meaning to the universe. I am happy to defer to certain people in various respects. But I also want to be in control of certain things and independent with respect to certain things. So I think all of us have some need for dependence and some need for independence. In that respect, authority ranking relationships respond to something deep in us. But it's more than that. As soon as an organization becomes very large, as soon as it becomes very complex, we have to organize things hierarchically. We cannot simply take a thousand people, let's say, turn them loose in a factory and say, well, do whatever you feel like doing. Somebody's got to set a production schedule. Somebody's got to assign tasks. Somebody's got to decide who's going to do what and allocate resources so that those jobs can be done. Management is essential. And whenever we say organization, we say hierarchy. Organizations of any size and complexity entail hierarchies, and that entails authority ranking relationships. So these are essential to any complex human organization or to any complex human task. Authority ranking relationships, though, do have a downside. They can become brutal. They can go badly wrong. All we have to do is think about Jim Jones and Jonestown and realize, yes, cults can go desperately wrong. It may be that too much authority is exerted by the person who is the leader. It may be that the leader begins to do deeply immoral things, and the followers may feel a responsibility to follow. 
people can find themselves trapped in situations where they are in an organization where they've pledged to do what the leader tells them to do and suddenly find themselves bound by conscience to diverge from that. It can create huge moral conflicts and sometimes it can lead to real human disasters when people follow orders to do horrible, horrible things. In almost any authority ranking relationship, superiors are capable of punishing subordinates and subordinates are not permitted in any way to punish superiors. In business organizations in the United States and in other developed countries, it is quite limited what a boss can do to an employee. But in many more traditional societies, it is possible for people higher in a hierarchy to inflict terrible, really brutal punishments on those below them. And it can even be a capital crime if that person has been insubordinate or has done anything to attack a superior. There is another kind of danger as well. People in higher positions on a hierarchy tend to realize that the same rules don't apply to them and can overextend that to allow themselves all sorts of moral exceptions. And so they can break rules that they would expect their subordinates to maintain. That's something we've seen throughout the pandemic, where political leaders impose restrictions on their subjects and then violate those very same restrictions. The mayor of the city I live in decreed that people should stay at home, and he made the order from Cabo in a video. <laughs> but that isn't unusual. All sorts of governors have prohibited travel and then have traveled to visit relatives. They've prohibited family gatherings for Thanksgiving, and then they've been together with their family. They have prohibited people from traveling overseas, and then they've gone overseas. That kind of thing is something we're all too familiar with. Congress routinely exempts itself from the laws it passes. Part of Newt Gingrich's contract with America in 1994 was to stop Congress from doing that. And for a while, when we had a, the Clinton administration in office and a Republican Congress, that was actually the law of the land. But as soon as those conditions ended, boom, Congress went back to exempting itself from many of the laws it passes. That's not just true of political leaders, however, it can be true in business organizations. People can place restrictions on travel, on training budgets and so on in hard times, and then they exempt themselves from that. They can also enforce rules in such a way that they are in a highly privileged position. In the company my wife worked for, someone at a lower position did all sorts of things that violated the normal expectations and indeed even the rights of other employees, including, for example, stealing people's lunches. But nothing happened to that person until he ventured up to the fifth floor, the executive floor, and stole people's lunches there. You can steal the manager's lunch. You can steal the division leader's lunch. Nothing happens. But steal the president's lunch, steal the vice president's lunch, boom, he was out that afternoon. So, yes, there can be conditions like that where people in a higher position not only claim legitimate responsibilities and legitimate powers and legitimately understand themselves as operating according to different norms, but quite illegitimately view themselves as capable of making exceptions for themselves, even on basic moral norms that they would expect anyone else to follow. Immanuel Kant said that the essence of immorality is making an exception for yourself. There is something about authority ranking relationships that tempts people in higher positions to make exceptions for themselves and thereby act immorally.